Good morning. You're locked in live, and I am your host, Algernon Cash. That's right. Every Sunday morning, I invite you to join me right here on WTOB at 8 a.m. for the only public affairs radio show that features my unique commentary on a wide range of topics. Thank you for being here with me this morning. Um, my job is to always help you stay engaged and informed about the issues that are happening, not only in your country, your state, but right here in your own backyard. And I promise you that I've got another exciting show lined up for you. That's right, I've got North Carolina Senator Joyce Krovic is gonna be here with us today. And she's gonna be talking a little bit about what's happening in the North Carolina General Assembly and their response to the COVID-19 outbreak. But before we get to Senator Kravik, I do wanna share a little bit of insight and thoughts on the recent announcement um, about Brianna Taylor. Um, we did finally, after about six months, we did get a decision from the state attorney general um, on the Brianna Taylor case. Um, um, for those that may not be aware, Brianna Taylor was a 26-year-old EMT based in Louisville, Kentucky, who actually lost her life while the police was serving a no-knock warrant at her home. The police apparently was looking for her ex-boyfriend and thought that he was in the home. Her ex-boyfriend was wanted um, in a drug conspiracy case. And it turned out that the ex-boyfriend was not in the home, but instead her current boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, was actually there with her. Uh, Mr. Walker certainly claimed that he did not realize that it was the police that was actually at the door. The police said that they actually knocked at the door, was banging at the door. Mr. Walker said he did hear the banging, but he never heard the police actually announce themselves. So he actually believed that he may have been the victim of a home invasion. Mr. Walker turned out to be a, um, um, uh, ha had a concealed weapon permit and actually grabbed his gun and fired on the police as they were rushing through the door, actually wounding one of the officers in the, in the thigh, which then caused the police, of course, to return fire. And unfortunately, the tragedy is that uh, Breonna Taylor was actually struck and killed during that, during that gunfire. Um, and so people have been patiently waiting to get to the conclusion of this investigation to see what the state was gonna do. Would there be any charges? What type of charges would occur? And a lot of those questions were answered uh, this past week. Um, Attorney General Daniel Cameron did decide that there were no murder charges that could be brought against the officers, but instead decided to pursue what we call a, a wanton endangerment charge, which essentially um, was charged against one of the officers for unjustifiably firing in, into Breonna Taylor's neighbor's home. Um, if convicted, um, that officer could serve up to 15 years in, in prison. But of course, I, I know that and for, for a lot of my listeners and those that may follow the show, I know for a lot of you, you still may be frustrated and felt like those charges should certainly be a lot more serious. Um, always, you know, as I've talked to people about this case throughout the week, um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'll, I'll say this, I'm not an attorney. Um, and I try not to pretend to be one either. I'm also not necessarily a criminal justice expert, but when you look at the legal definition of, of murder, it means to do it, to premeditate, to premeditate a killing of someone um, unlawfully. And I, I think the thing that people probably need to understand about this entire case is that the police was actually not there unlawfully. They were there lawfully. They were there serving a legal warrant um, and took on gunfire and government statute says that they can return fire and they can return fire lethally, uh, meaning that they can, they can do it with deadly force. Um, of course, I, I think protesters have all, obviously already taken to the streets. There's been uh, just um, um, several protests in Louisville, Kentucky since the incident happened earlier in the year, um, but, but certainly protesters were very angered and um, about the decision. And, you know, I'm frustrated about the decision only because you do have an innocent young lady who's lost her life. She's been killed prematurely, and that should frustrate any one of us, you know, white, black, Hispanic, whatever. But I'm more frustrated about bad um, policies that exist on our books. Um, we should not have policies that allow the police to come into your home in the middle of the night. Um, and without even necessarily having to knock, even though in this case the police did knock, but they didn't have to knock, 
um, we, we've really got to take a hard look at some of these, uh, what I describe as liberal public policies that allow government agencies like law enforcement to overreach and to, to use these statutes that end up cre creating the kind of incidents that we see either with, with a Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or the um, um, dozens and dozens of other incidents that we've talked about over the last, last several years. Because bad policies, bad public policy can certainly lead to grave outcomes. And I think that's exactly what happened in the, the case of, of, of Breonna Taylor. I think people should be very frustrated that we have these kind of policies on the books. And I think people should go to work to actually try to change them. Um, certainly, you, you can protest and you should do that peacefully, that the Constitution gives you that right, that right to free speech. And certainly the protests do bring awareness to, to really, really important issues that we need to be talking about here in the country. But we, we've got to do more than protests. It's got to go beyond the protests. If, if you disagree with these policies, we've, people have got to get organized. They've, they've got to form a campaign. They've got to get someone elected. They, they've got to go about actually changing the laws. And I, I, I'm someone who really believes in what I call American idealism. I believe in the American idea. I believe in the vision that our founding fathers had for this country. And we've not fully realized that vision, at least not for all of us. We still have work to do. Um, certainly, we've made a lot of progress, significant progress in this country. But we have more that we can do. And so we need the energy of all these young activists and everyone who's so frustrated about this case to really go to work within the system to, to try to start changing the, these policies. Um, I use an analogy. If you're a hurdle racer, uh, part of being able to be victorious in your race is to first acknowledge you have hurdles there and understand that the obstacles do exist, but you still got to run the race. And you've got to run the race learning how to actually get over those hurdles. And I think that's what's happening here in our country. We just have to acknowledge that there are certain realities that we need to go to work on. Um, we, we do need to try to overcome those challenges and obstacles so that we can change and create a better future. Um, and, and I think that we should do that not only for Breonna Taylor, but the countless others that have, have lost their lives um, as, we, as we've been on this journey. Um, you know, within the protest that happened on the night of the announcement, um, two officers actually got shot, and then also two bystanders, two um, protest bystanders also got shot. So I would also like to add that, you know, you've got a young lady like Breonna Taylor, who is the victim of senseless gun violence, and I don't think the way to honor her or memorialize her is to actually generate and create more senseless gun violence. It, it just doesn't make any sense. So for those that are out there listening, um, my friends, um, my, my supporters, my listeners, um, certainly all of our prayers and thoughts should be with, um, the Breonna, Ta with Breonna Taylor's family. Um, they certainly knew her better than all of us. Um, but we also need to be um, vigilant and can continue to stay focused on making sure that we identify bad public policy, like things like no-knock warrants, um, we need to take a harder look at um, when the police can use lethal and deadly force. In this case, Mr. Walker fired on the police one time, and the police actually fired back at him 30 times. So that would be the equivalent of me kicking you, and then you taking out a gun and shooting me. So we need to be looking at all these things, and it's going to take a collective effort to do so. So again, if you're just now joining us, you are locked in live. I am your host, Algernon Cash. It's uh, Sunday morning right here on WTOB. And I've got a special guest that I want to introduce you to. She's also a really good friend of mine. And she's your North Carolina Senator, um, Joyce Kravick. Um, Senator Kravick, how are you this morning? Hi, Algernon. Thank you so much for having me on. Great to see you. Yes, yes, yes. Glad to have you here. Um, I know you all have been really, really busy. I, I think 2020, we all, we all, we're, I think we're all ready for a new year. I, I, I can't wait till December 31st um, so that maybe we can hit reset and, and start over here. Um, you know, Senator Kravick, I know in addition to you um, being in the General Assembly, you also have a background as a small business owner. Um, you've been a community activist, so you're someone who has been very active in North Carolina for a very long time. I think you would agree that we are 
in, and I, I know the word unprecedented has been overused um, so much here in the last six months, but I, I don't know any better way to describe it, but that we're in unprecedented times. We still do have um, parts of our state economy is, is shut down. Um, you know, businesses not able to operate or, you know, some businesses that are able to operate are being forced to operate at a reduced capacity. Um, we have mandates to wear masks now. There's so many changes that I think all of us are having to sort of get used to and, and acquainted with. You also, within the North Carolina Senate, you chair the Health and Human Services Committee. So you're a little bit at the center of the storm right now, as, as I would call it. You know, my first question for you, help me and my listeners understand, how would you grade Governor Cooper and mm -hmm. Secretary Cohen's response to the, to the outbreak? Well, thank you, Algernon. Thank you for the question. I have been pretty outspoken about uh, disagreeing with the governor and the secretary on many issues. Um, in the beginning, I think uh, we all agreed that we needed to shut down, slow down, uh, until we could get our hands around what was going on. It was very frightening. I mean, we'd never had to deal with anything like this before, so it's very frightening. But um, the governor's uh, orders, his executive orders, have been so um, so spotted. I could never understand why it was safe. Uh, I mean, every business is essential if it's your business. And... Um, I couldn't understand why it was safe for us to go by the hundreds to Walmart and to Home Depot and Lowe's, and they were always packed because they were a few things that were open and operating, but it wasn't safe to go downtown to your local little retail shop that only has maybe a dozen customers a day. Um, none of it made any sense to me. Um, I have actually questioned and petitioned the uh, secretary and the governor for information. What data are they using? They were not transparent with the data. Uh, one set of data would indicate one thing, one set of data would indicate something else. The school reopening, why is it safe for a fifth grader to be in class, but it's not safe for a sixth grader? Um, they're just, they keep saying they're gonna follow the science and the data, but it doesn't appear that way to me. It has been very, um, picking winners and losers, and the data just has not added up to some of the decisions that they have been made. So I've been very critical of that, um, even though I agree with many of the things that they've done, but there are many of them that I disagree with. I think you should have facts, data, science, and you should look at all of it, and you should do what it uh, indicates should be done, and you shouldn't be just picking and choosing and it appears that that's what's been happening um, in, in many of the governor's executive orders. So I've been very vocal about that. Well, and I, I can sense your frustration, and I've, I've had conversations with uh, many members of the North Carolina General Assembly in, in your chamber, as well as the lower chamber, who also express a, a similar frustration. And surprisingly, I, I, that frustration happens a little bit on both sides of the aisle. I've, I've actually had some, I don't, I don't know if some of these Democrats would say it publicly, but they've said right. it to me privately that they're very frustrated with the governor because of right. the lack of clear and, and concise and transparent communication. And I can tell, excuse me, Algernon, I can tell you why, because they're hearing from their constituents and their small business owners, and we have to explain to them why they're not able to operate and continue their businesses. Many of them have shut down permanently and they won't be coming back and lives have changed dramatically. And um, some of it was, um, so those, those Democrats are hearing from their constituents as well, but excuse me for interrupting you. No, no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. I, I, I can, again, I know it's something that you're, you're, you're passionate about and, um, I, you know, but the biggest the biggest frustration that I hear from again from you from from Democrats as well is just the the lack of clear communication that that you know oftentimes right. these announcements and these press conferences uh, you know no one is is getting a, a heads up or a warning or or any insight about what the announcement's going to be um, mm -hmm. but, you know the General Assembly is charged with providing oversight o over That's the executive correct. branch. Um, have, have you all in the Senate, and again, you chair the Health and Human Services Committee, have y'all been holding hearings? I mean, are, is the secretary or the governor responding to, to your committee at all? Or 
Um, the secretary has responded. I had uh, sent her a very lengthy letter asking for lots of information. Uh, this was a few weeks ago. And last Wednesday, they did deliver thumb drives to my office with the information I had requested. And we we're in the process of going through it because it's very massive. Uh, I had asked for a lot of information that had not been shared with us. And so I'm not sure how much is going to be shared in the documents that I have received from them, but um, we are going through it now. Staff is looking through it thoroughly to see um, you know, if, there are, if there's data there that we can use. But you're exactly right. Um, they have not been transparent. They did not share that information until I um, formally requested it. Um, and then, of course, it did come forward, you know, a few weeks later, but it was a, it was a massive undertaking to gather the information. So, um, you know, I allotted for the time. I knew that it was not an easy task and they've had their hands full. Uh, they've been very busy and I understand that as well, but we do need the data. We need to know why these decisions have been made. And also, um, Algernon, while we have not been, um, our outbreaks have not been nearly as bad as some other states, North Carolina is still the 49th most restricted state in the country. And uh, I'm amazed that our economy is hanging on as well as it is with those restrictions that have been in place for so long, but ours are much worse than other states in the country. Well, you talk about the restrictions and, you know, the governor cites the um, emergency powers, emergency executive powers that he has to be able to do a lot of the things that he's doing right now. Are, are we, I, 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 you know, I tell people, I tell my friends and others, I think this is the year that everyone has gotten a civics lesson. And, right. you know, some people are waking up and didn't realize that the governor had this much power. Um, that he could, you know, shut down churches and shut down businesses and stop you from going to work out and going to the hair salon and all these things that, you know, people are waking up and saying, wow, I didn't, I didn't know the governor could actually do those things. So all of a sudden we're getting a crash course on civics here this year. Did, are we at a point here in our state where we need to look at restructuring the, those emergency powers? I mean, are we allowing the executive branch to have too much authority? Absolutely. Um, I don't think anybody ever the governor used the uh, Emergency Powers Act that we have in place that has traditionally been dealt with um, hurricanes, floods, fires, those kinds of things. And um, we've never had to deal with a pandemic before. And the governor was actually challenged on whether he had that authority or not. And the court ruled, and of course, we know we have a, let's face it, we have a very liberal court in North Carolina and the court sided with the governor that he did have that authority. So um, yeah, I don't think any one person should have that much authority. Um, our understanding was that the um, Council of State also had to um, agree with, or um, where in, in reality, I think it said he had to consult with them. Um, my understanding from some of the Council of State members, he only consulted with them once when he let them know he was going to do that. Some of them disagreed with some of the governor's policies, but um, the court said you don't have the authority to, uh, to do that. So yeah, I think we absolutely need to look at some changes um, coming forward because this is something that nobody ever dreamed would happen and that the governor would need or would use that type of power. Yeah, I think all of us would, would be supportive of that. Um, and I, I think there's even some folks within the, the Democratic Party that would also support some, some restructuring of how how things work. But, um, you know, you, you mentioned the economy. You said the state economy's holding on. I, I would agree with you. I've been a little shocked by that too, that, you know, mm -hmm. it, things are not great. Don't get me wrong. I, right. I mean, right. you know, every day that goes by, I hear about another business making the decision that they're shutting down permanently. Oftentimes these are businesses that have been around 50, 60, 70 years, and they, they just feel like, you know, it, it's probably time to go ahead and make, make an exit. So I don't think the economy's great, but it certainly it isn't performing as badly as I think a lot of us um, predicted or, or even right. expected. Talk to me a little bit about the state's fiscal situation right now. I, I know you, I know we received over a billion dollars in CARES Act funding from the federal government. That certainly helped a lot. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of helping us navigate this year. You all um, will be debating a budget when the new session starts. 
Um, any any early predictions on um, how big the deficit may be and ideas on how the General Assembly plans to, to deal with that? Or um, Yes. Uh, let me um, back up a little bit to why we have not hurt as badly as some states have. We have been in a much better position. When Republicans uh, took over the majority in 2010, they uh, had a $2.8 billion debt owed to the federal government. The rainy day fund had been depleted. The highway trust fund had been depleted. Teacher pay had been frozen for seven years. We were in a very difficult position, but we set about having some very fiscally sound policies. We, um, we roll back some regulations, we cut taxes, we paid that debt back by increasing revenues. We didn't cut funding anywhere. We just increased revenues by having policies that were fiscally sound so that businesses could expand, people could get back to work. We had the fifth highest unemployment rate in the country. And then we uh, cut that in half. We paid that debt back in 30 months to the federal government. And then we started re replenishing the rainy day fund, the highway trust fund. So by building up those reserves, we were able to get through this horrible uh, pandemic that we've had to face. And we are gonna be facing a budget deficit next year. Originally, our um, economist told us between four and $5 billion. Uh, we aren't sure now. They are saying things aren't as bad as we expected. So it may not be as bad as they had originally predicted, and we certainly hope that's the case. But there will be some difficult decisions to be made, no question about that. Well, I, I can recall when, when um, you all were making a lot of these decisions to, to beef up all these reserves, you, you took a lot of criticism, um, oh, yeah. really, really from people on the right and the left. Uh, you, right. You, you, had, you had folks on the right who believed that you shouldn't be holding all this money and that maybe you ought to be returning it back, back to the people. And of course on the left, um, they wanted you to go ahead and spend more of the money, but either way you all were taking a lot of heat uh, exactly. when, when you were building up these reserves. So it turns out that um, someone in the general assembly must've had some kind of a crystal ball. And um, the, the fact that y'all took those actions, I think is certainly um, worked in our benefit as we've went, as we're going through this very unprecedented time. Currently, we don't have a budget. We, we've been operating on continuing resolutions. I, I've, I've forgotten how long, how now. I, I know many, many years. Do you, do you think we'll get a budget in this upcoming long session? Um, I certainly hope so. But, you know, in hindsight, it has been a real, a tremendous blessing that we didn't get a budget because we had increased spending in that budget. And when we don't get a budget, we continue on the prior budgets. Um, fiscal numbers. So by um, not having a new budget last year with the increased spending in it, we're operating on the previous budget. So there's some savings there. So looking at the situation that we're in now, um, the governor vetoed the budget. We couldn't override the veto. So teacher raises were not given. I will say the first time since Republicans um, were in the majority that teachers did not get a raise because the governor didn't think it was enough. And so he vetoed the budget, that plus other issues that he disagreed with. So we got none of those spending increases that we had actually agreed upon with the, with the, um, with the House. And uh, so it's really, um, it's really saving us some money. So that's part of the reason we won't be in the shape that we're in. But even when we went back um, last week, week before, for the COVID relief package to spend the remainder of those funds, we still had the other side wanting to spend the rainy day fund, the reserves, and we had three major hurricanes over the last few years, two back to back, that were contained massive amounts of recovery spending that we had to use from that rainy day fund. So um, I am so happy that we did not buckle to the pressure that we were under to spend those funds for um, for social programs, for increased spending that the Democrats wanted to do. So I'm, I'm very happy that we didn't do that because we're going to need those funds now just to pay the regular bills. If you're just now joining us, you're locked in live. It's Sunday morning. You're right here on WTOB. My name is Algernon Cash. I'm your host this morning. 
And the other voice that you hear is uh, Forsyth County or North Carolina Senator representing Forsyth County, um, Joyce Kravick. Um, we're talking about some of the unprecedented times we've been going through here with the General Assembly as it relates to COVID-19 and the budget and so many other things, that, so many other obstacles that we've, we've been facing as a state. Um, but Senator Kravick, you, outside of um, some of the things that you're having to do as your regular job in the General Assembly, you're also in the middle of an election. This is a big, big election year. Um, I, you know, you know, I think we always say every time an election rolls around that this is the biggest election of our lifetime. But I'm, I'm actually think I think I believe it this year that this is the biggest election of our lifetime. Um, you represent the 31st district, and um, you'll be on the ballot in in November. Um, your district was redrawn, so you you do have a competitive challenge this year. Help my listeners understand. I mean that you you you've done a few terms in the North Carolina Senate. Help us understand why you feel like you should be reelected. I mean, what are what are some of your biggest accomplishments and then what do you feel like you still want to get done? Thank you, Algernon. Well, first of all, I'm very honored to represent the citizens of the 31st District and I have represented them for seven years. A brief stint over in the House before I went to the Senate, but I've been very honored to be there and serve the citizens. I will say also, according to our Constitution, we have new districts every 10 years after a census is taken. This is the third district that I have had in three elections. So every election cycle, I've had a new district. Um, so, you know, I get to know the folks in my district, serve those folks, they get to know me, then I've got a new district next time. So I have to start over uh, introducing myself to folks who know nothing about me. So uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity this morning, but I have been very blessed to be there and serve the citizens, as I said. Um, I chair health care and uh, help, appro help HHS appropriations, which is uh, a huge budget, a huge budget. We deal with all of the health, the uh, health and human services, child welfare, foster care. Uh, my big passion has been um, with uh, foster children, the child welfare system. I've had a lot of um, success there simply because I started hearing from so many parents and foster parents and situations that people were, people were dealing with. So we've been in the process. We uh, passed a bill called Ryland's Law, which is completely transforming the way Health and Human Services works in the child welfare system. So I've been honored to be a part of that. I've served on the social services working group that designed that policy. Uh, I've also served on the child fatality task force where we deal with um, the mortalities of our children in North Carolina. I passed a law that I'm very proud of called Burt's Law, which uh, deals with people in congregate settings, group homes, uh, nursing homes, where there is abuse. And um, I met a mother at an event who told me the story of her son who had been abused for years in a group home. He has autism and other learning disabilities. And uh, we found out that it, the law requires that you report any abuse, but there's no punishment for not reporting it. In that particular case, the employees of the group home had, imported, had reported this abuse, but it never got outside the system of that. They didn't want the publicity. They didn't want to be sued. So they just kind of covered it up. And when I learned that, I was appalled by that. And so we changed that and we passed Burt's Law. So now there are penalty, criminal penalties if you do not report it. So we put teeth in it where it has to be abided by. If not, you will be punished. I also passed a law um, that I was a primary sponsor of to uh, require insurance companies to provide insurance for children with autism. And when I first got to the General Assembly, I learned they had been trying for about 10 years to pass this bill and it just didn't go anywhere because there was opposition from the insurance companies and they didn't want to, um, they didn't want to have to cover those children. Well, when I learned, and at first I understood it, you know, everything has a cost. So I thought, okay, they're, you know, trying to figure out how to do this. But then I learned if you were a Medicaid patient or you were a state employee, your children were covered. The only people who weren't covered couldn't even purchase the insurance were the people who were paying the bills for the rest of us to have that coverage. That was terribly unfair to me in my mind. 
So uh, I set about getting that changed and it was a lot of hard work. It was a huge lift because there was so much opposition in the beginning, but we finally got that passed and I am so happy now those children are getting the therapy that they need to cover their, um, their autism um, health and to help them to become productive citizens that they can be with this, uh, it's called ABA therapy, which is the only approved therapy for autistic children. And it's uh, data-driven um, and it's, I'm just so proud of that bill. Well, Senator, um, I'm running out of time, but, but thank you for being here with this morning. Um, thank you for your service and your passion and certainly your, your uh, commitment to, to North Carolina. Um, I, again, it, it'd take me many, many more shows to help people understand all the great work you've done actually across the state, not just here in Forsyth County. So you've been locked in live. I'm your host this morning, Algernon Cash. Um, you've been listening to North Carolina Senator Joyce Krawick. And again, she will be on the ballot in November. She's representing the 31st District. As we get ready to wrap up this morning, I want us to take a quick moment of silence um, so that we can remember and, and, and reflect and think about the life of Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor was 26 years old. We're gonna take a 26 second moment of silence before we close out the show. Y'all stay locked in.